comes during a day of urgent warnings with tensions ratcheted up. U.S. officials advising all Americans in Ukraine to get out now. Could Russia invade Ukraine within days or will diplomacy save the day? President Biden now preparing for a call with Russian President Putin. Our team's standing by with the latest. A glimmer of immediate hope for millions of parents now gone. The FDA delays a review of Pfizer's vaccine for children younger than five to six months of age. What's next for the young and the unprotected? How long is the delay? And what happens next? ABC News Live asking a doctor your most urgent questions. A deadly and chaotic standoff puts police officers back into the crosshairs. The desperate scramble to end a barricade with a baby inside. Billions of dollars of goods blocked by a line of truckers. American factories taking a hit from a Canadian protest. The fines and jail time that demonstrators could face. And a new promise from a judge to bring protests to an end. Quarterbacks in the spotlight as we count down to Super Bowl 56. Hear from the people who know team leaders Joe Burrow and Matt Stafford the best. Some people said he, he wouldn't be back maybe the whole season. He probably wouldn't be. Uh, back to the caliber of player that he was. And once again, you know, the, the chip on the shoulder and trying to prove people wrong. I am so excited for him. I mean, he has worked his butt off for a long time. And what's a Super Bowl weekend without a Super Bowl shindig? How to throw the perfect party while saving some money. And good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following that decision to postpone the FDA review of Pfizer's vaccine for children as young as six months of age to wait for more data. But we do need to begin tonight with that dire warning by the U.S. government about Ukraine, telling all Americans there to get out immediately, their words, saying Russia could invade at any time. 3,000 more American troops now headed to Eastern Europe. And tonight, additional Russian ships have arrived in the Black Sea for naval exercises that are effectively blockading Ukraine. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan addressed the increasingly grave situation late today, detailing the credible prospect Russian military action could take place before the end of the Olympics. President Biden, though, is hoping to dial back the tensions a bit in a phone call with President Putin tomorrow. The last time the leader spoke, December 30th. We are standing by to talk with former ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor, to see if he thinks any diplomatic off-ramps are still even available. But first, ABC News Live anchor Terry Moran leads us off from Kyiv tonight. At the White House today, the urgent new warning. Russia could attack Ukraine at any time over the next several days. There is a credible prospect that a Russian military action would take place even before the end of the Olympics. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan saying that while the U.S. has not concluded that Vladimir Putin has given the actual order to invade Ukraine, the time for U.S. citizens there to get out is now. We want to be crystal clear on this point. Any American in Ukraine should leave as soon as possible and in any event in the next 24 to 48 hours. And Sullivan warned that U.S. troops would not be used to evacuate American citizens. The dire assessment of the crisis comes a day after President Biden offered this warning about how fast the situation could deteriorate. We're dealing with one of the largest armies in the world. This is a very different situation and things could go crazy quickly. Another ominous sign, talks between Russia and Ukraine have all but collapsed in Berlin. After nine hours of negotiation, the two sides couldn't even agree to a joint statement. It comes as the Russians conducted their second day of massive war games around much of the Ukrainian frontier and sent more warships into the Black Sea. In response to the daily buildup of Russian forces, the U.S. sent 90 tons of military aid to Ukraine just today, including more Javelin anti-tank missiles, as well as ordering 3,000 more soldiers from the 82nd Airborne to leave Fort Bragg for Poland. American F-16s also arrived in Romania today as U.S. forces continue to bolster NATO's eastern flank. But the White House insists no U.S. soldier will step foot in Ukraine to fight. For Americans who live here, the call for them to leave is hard. 25-year-old American teacher Aaron Starr, who has a job and a Ukrainian girlfriend here in Kyiv, told us he won't evacuate yet. It's hard to leave your life. Like, obviously, if there's an actual war, I'll leave, OK? I'm not going to live in a war zone. But in advance of that, it's hard to leave. 
And Terry joins us now from Ukraine. Terry, the warning about the threat of Russian invasion has taken on new urgency today. Tell us what's driving that and also how Russia is responding. Well, Phil, what is driving it, according to National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in that briefing, he said the new urgency is based on, quote, what we are seeing on the ground and what our intelligence analysts have picked up, clearly indicating this is not a guess or an assessment by, you know, intelligence analysts, that this, whether through human sources or signals uh, intelligence, they have, they believe some kind of insight into what's going on inside the Kremlin. Now, how is Russia responding? Well, the foreign ministry spokesman uh, for the Kremlin has said that this is all, quote, hysteria. And he said something interesting. He said that this is because the Anglo-Saxons want war at any price. Uh, and he said this is all aimed at discrediting Russia's legitimate security demands uh, in Europe, given the expansion of NATO. Uh, and that is what we have from the Russians tonight. Phil? Terry Moran from Ukraine tonight. Thank you. Okay, so for more now on this tenuous situation, we bring in former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, William Taylor. Sir, thanks so much for taking the time with us tonight. We really do appreciate it. Glad to be here, Phil. Okay, so right off the bat, the White House says that President Biden and President Putin will have a phone conversation tomorrow. As President Biden has ordered another 3,000 soldiers to Poland, what do you think that says about how likely it is that Russia is going to invade Ukraine? Phil, the likelihood is high. Uh, President Putin, apparently, according to Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, has not yet made a decision. So there is uh, there is a chance that he could still reconsider. Um, he has clearly moved all of the weapons and troops, uh, ships and supplies to the front lines. He's clearly ready to do this. However, the cost of doing this, the price that he personally, and the Russian people more generally will pay or just amazing. So for him to take this decision is irresponsible in my view, but, uh, but he might do this. He's invaded before. We have to be ready, but there is also the chance that he could be looking for a way out. Well, so let's go back to that high stakes phone call tomorrow. Then we also understand that uh, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron is going to speak with President Putin tomorrow. How can President Biden even push for de-escalation at this point? Countries are ordering citizens to leave Ukraine. Do sanctions even matter anymore? They absolutely do. They absolutely do matter. And it's not just the sanctions, Phil. I mean, that's that's a big thing. President Putin needs to be concerned about uh, the effect on on Russia on the Russian economy and on, on everyday Russians. I mean, these sanctions we're talking about will hit every Russian. <clears throat> Everybody who has a bank account um, will be, and, and Russia will be affected by this. So President Putin has to take those into account. It's not just the sanctions. He also has to worry, President Putin has to worry that an attack, that an invasion of his neighbor, Ukraine, will not be popular in Russia. Russian citizens generally have a good view a good attitude towards Ukraine. And when they hear President Putin talking about invading them, they may take to the streets. They may oppose this idea. They, they may make it clear that they don't support this kind of invasion. It may destabilize President Putin's own regime. Okay. So he's got a lot to think about, and the sanctions are one of them. All right, so let's go with he hasn't made a final decision yet. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan talked about the defensive deployment of U.S. forces. Help us understand what that means and how it's different from an offensive deployment, because we understand these troops are not going there to fight, but what happens if there's an invasion? So these troops are going there to reinforce NATO allies on the eastern flank of NATO. And so they, these 3,000 troops and, and more uh, coming will augment the 60,000 troops that are already there and being moved, moved towards the east, toward East European allies. Those are defensive positions. They are defending against any kind of invasion. But if President Putin decides to send his tanks west across the border into Ukraine, that movement is toward NATO. So the NATO allies have to be very ready, very concerned to be prepared for that kind of an attack. And if that happens, uh, then we'll be prepared. I don't know if you've seen the statement, but we, we, we got a statement from President 
Putin in response to the troops that are heading over to Poland. Uh, he says that 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 the West wants war. Um, you know, so that you go back and forth with with these comments. What's the possibility of Russia engaging in this so-called false flag operation that we've heard so much about to create a pretense for war? Wouldn't the world see right through that? I mean, at least our country has been throwing up red flags in that direction. Absolutely. That's exactly the purpose, Phil, of uh, releasing that intelligence. Normally, the intelligence agencies are hesitant to release this kind of information. But this time, for exactly the reason that you say, uh, the intelligence agencies allowed that, that information to be made public so that the world knows, we know, uh, the Ukrainians know, and the Russians know that that, that uh, has been exposed. And that false flag, that having Russian special operatives inside Ukraine attacking Russians to give the excuse, to give the rationale for the Russians then to invade into Ukraine. So that would be Russian people attacking Russian soldiers to give the excuse for them to, to go into Ukraine. That's now been exposed. So that was a very good move. Ambassador, finally, I just I have to get your expertise on this. With everything that has played out to date, with all of the Russian troops hearing that President Putin has what he needs for a full-scale invasion that would cost an awful lot of lives, what's the off-ramp for him now? Legitimately, what can he say to save face after setting up like this? First of all, it's not our business to save his face. But um, second of all, he has said over and over, and his foreign minister has said over and over that he doesn't intend to invade Ukraine. He said this, so he could point to that. He could point and say, look, I never intended to, uh, to uh, invade Ukraine. What I need, what I wanted, and now what I've succeeded in getting is the West, in particular the United States, has finally taken my security concerns seriously. And not only are they taking them seriously, they're going to sit down and negotiate hard treaties that will that will mean that their B-52 bombers never fly within 12 miles of, our, of, our, of the Russian borders any again, or that they will never put missiles into Ukraine that can threaten Moscow in seven minutes. He can say that we are finally taking his security concerns seriously. He can tell the Russian people that he won, and he never intended to do it anyway. Right. And no doubt he would call that a win. He certainly has the attention of the world on him right now during the Olympics. Ambassador Taylor, thank you so much for your insights. We always appreciate it. Thank you, Phil. Now to the battle against COVID-19, the whiplash tonight after the FDA delays the review of Pfizer's vaccine for children under five, saying they want more data. It comes amid some good news, though, that cases continue to drop. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos with the latest. Tonight, a stunning reversal. Just days before an expert panel was set to meet, the FDA and Pfizer announcing regulators will need more time before deciding whether to authorize the vaccine for children under five. Okay, you're done. At this time, it makes sense for us to wait until we have the data from uh, the evaluation of a third dose. Uh, before taking action. Pfizer had signaled that three doses of the vaccine will be needed after two doses failed to produce a strong immune response in two to four-year-olds. But the trial data from that third dose won't be available until early April. Pulling back right now, getting all the data is the right thing to do. It should be encouraging that we aren't trying to push this too quickly. But the delay is a setback for millions of parents eager to get their young kids vaccinated. When it was available, we got right on it, so we wanted it for the kids too to be able to kind of be out in the world some more. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. It makes me err more on the side of caution over the vaccine, and I'm in no rush. 18 million kids under five are still not eligible for a vaccine, but a recent poll showed just three in 10 parents would get them vaccinated right away. And tonight, a new CDC study finds Pfizer and Moderna boosters were highly effective at keeping people out of the hospital. But that effectiveness decreased after about four months, raising the possibility that some people, like the elderly or those with health conditions, may need a fourth dose. There's certain people whose immune systems are not functioning at peak efficiency. And so certainly those 65 and older may well need to have an additional dose. It comes as new COVID cases plunge to their lowest levels since Christmas, and more mask mandates are dropping by the day. USA! USA! 
In New York City, protests against COVID mandates as municipal workers face a vaccination deadline. About 3,000 workers, 1% of the workforce, could lose their jobs if they don't get the shot by the end of the day. And Stephanie joins us now. Stephanie, the FDA was asked about the new timeline for the vaccine in young children and whether the delay had anything to do with the drop in cases we've been seeing. What was the response? Exactly, Phil. They were. Peter Marks of the FDA says they will work as quickly as possible as that data comes in over the next two months. Health officials right now are urging parents to make sure they're vaccinated and also take every precaution possible with their youngest children, like masking. Phil. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. Joining us now for more is Dr. Peter Hotez, a professor of pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine. Doctor, thanks so much for taking the time tonight. Thanks so much for having me. As a parent, I think a lot of parents are going to say this is a little bit of a setback. I also think safety first, most people would say. Do you think the FDA made the right choice waiting until we get all the data, despite the very high caseload, especially among children? Well, I think, you know, I think that the, the decision made today is actually the correct one uh, because this is looking like a three dose vaccine. And it was really critically important to wait to get all of the information on all three doses before moving ahead prematurely just with information on two doses. I think what was driving the former decision was the fact that this Omicron wave was bringing, landing so many kids in the hospital. Uh, both the FDA and CDC felt some urgency to start the vaccination process sooner rather than later. It was a tough judgment call, but with Omicron having that screaming level of transmission, I think that was the that was the decision then. Now that Omicron is decelerating as fast as it went up and we're going to be in a nadir, hopefully, if everything goes according to the plan in the same trajectory in a couple of weeks, I think that that pressure, that urgency is sort of off. And now we have kind of the luxury of a little bit more time to wait till we fully evaluate the three doses. Bottom line, I think it was a good decision to make. First and foremost, any parent will know this, it is terrifying when your child is sick with anything serious. But then there's this, the Omicron variant, as you uh, mentioned, has been tearing through communities for several months now, especially among children. So what do we know about the severity of the virus for children under the age of five? Well, we've seen thousands of kids uh, getting infected and hospitalized. Um, and, and whether or not this virus is selectively targeting the kids, that's less clear. I think what's happening is this is so transmissible that it's creating a, a virus blizzard or firestorm and kids are getting swept up in it. And so um, a lot of kids are doing quite well with this virus, but a fair number are getting hospitalized and sick with, especially the younger kids with bronchiolitis, older kids uh, with more with illness that more resembles what's in the teenagers. So the decision to move forward with pediatric vaccinations has been in place for a while right now. We have the emergency use authorization uh, of the five to 11 year olds, and they're also evaluating a booster in the five to 11 year olds. I mean, no compromise five to 11 year olds are all already eligible for a booster. So um, we're, I think what's happening is the FDA uh, together with the companies are moving as fast as they can without any kind of compromise or safety or, or doing anything prematurely. So what would you advise parents of children under the age of five while the rest of the country has access to the vaccine? This is kind of the last group that is vulnerable. Is there a back to normal if your kids are under five and haven't been vaccinated? Well, not right now because um, there is still quite a high level of transmission, even though it's going down. It's, we're still at around 200,000 new cases a day, which is uh, quite a high level. The good news is it's going down so quickly that within uh, two weeks, we could really be uh, near a nadir if it goes down at the same trajectory. The only asterisk I'm putting on that is I am a bit concerned about the BA2 subvariant, whether that starts to accelerate. It's not looking like it so far, but there's always that possibility. Uh, but as long as that holds off and the number of cases go down, we'll have the luxury to evaluate the three doses. And then, uh, there's, if, and then if the stars really align, uh, within a month or so, we could be getting back to uh, life that's looking pretty normal and maybe even relaxing masking restrictions in a number of the schools. Now, that is really good to hear you say. Uh, finally, do you believe the, why do you believe the majority of parents with kids between the ages of 5 and 11 are not getting their children vaccinated? And do you think that will be the same thing when the go-ahead is given to kids under the age of 5? 
Yeah, unfortunately, there is a lot of reluctance right now around uh, vaccinating kids. We're, you know, and it's very much a regional as well. So, for instance, even among the teenagers, 12 to 17, the rates of vaccination among those groups are double in the Northeast what it is here in the South and in Texas. And these same parents that have the teenagers are having the younger kids as well. And I think we'll have to assume that they're also holding back. Um, many are uh, uh, haven't seen uh, mRNA vaccines for their kids yet. And so I think that may be part of it. All right, Dr. Peter Hotez, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Thank you. And tonight a Canadian judge is stepping in to try and end that trucker protest that is blocking billions of dollars in goods from reaching factories here in the United States. ABC's Elwin Lopez with more. Tonight, a possible end to the standoff at the busiest border crossing between the U.S. and Canada. A judge in Windsor, Ontario, issuing an injunction, ordering the removal of protesters. The move comes after Ontario declared a state of emergency for the entire province, threatening fines of up to $100,000 and jail time if they don't move out. Your right to make a political statement does not outweigh the rights of a million people in Ottawa to live peacefully, free of harassment and chaos in their own homes. The blockade at the Ambassador Bridge now in its fifth day, halting crucial auto parts from crossing parts that automakers immediately need. Toyota now saying this has led to a periodic downtime at engine plants in West Virginia and Alabama and factories in Kentucky. Today, President Biden once again speaking with Prime Minister Trudeau. President expressed his concern that the United States, that United States companies and workers are experiencing serious effects, including slowdowns in production, shortened work hours, and plant closures. Michigan's governor says she's willing to do whatever it takes to help. It's quickly turning into a homeland security issue on top of the economic pain that they've already caused. And now a new warning of potential protests in the U.S. targeting this weekend's Super Bowl in Los Angeles. We're following that situation in Canada very closely, and we know very seriously that this event, this world stage event, poses opportunities for people who wish to interrupt it. And Phil, I just spoke to a factory worker who tells me she's out of work and doesn't know when she's going to get her next paycheck. Experts are now estimating that auto workers could lose up to $51 million this week alone. Phil? Elwin, thank you for that. When we come back, so much attention right now is on Ukraine, while the nuclear situation on the ground in Iran grows more worrisome by the day. Our Martha Raddatz is there. The decades-long cold murder case cracked by a college student. But up next, the deadly standoff, the dramatic rescue of a baby, and the nine officers shot at during another bloody day for law enforcement in America. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I risked my life. I put my family in danger. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. But it was the right thing to do. It was the only thing to do. Terror plot foiled in Garden City, Kansas. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. It would have been Oklahoma City. He put his family, himself, in jeopardy for us. 
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. What you're looking at and listening to is, frankly, disgusting. No other way to describe it. Spectators during a New York high school basketball game could be heard making racially charged chants while players of color took free throws. Pearl River School District says it's investigating. Next to the barricade turned deadly shooting that left several officers injured in an already bloody year for law enforcement, ABC's chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, reports from Phoenix tonight. Get back! Get back! Tonight, a clearer picture of what led to the horror playing out in this Phoenix neighborhood. The deadly hours-long standoff left five officers shot, four more wounded by shrapnel. It all began with a 911 call overnight about a woman shot in a domestic dispute. And as an officer approached the home, police say he was lured. He was actually invited inside by the suspect. The suspect ambushed him with a gun and shot him several times. Police swarmed, SWAT called out, rifles pointed at that house, when suddenly the door opens. Authorities say this man, who was not the shooter, carefully placing an infant on the doorstep. Then he backs up towards police, hands in the air. And as officers move in to rescue the baby, a barrage of gunshots from inside the house hitting officers. Those who could ran, others hobbling or carried out of range. The street littered with wounded cops, some writhing in agony. Four shot in that incident, another four hit by shrapnel. Those officers were all able to get back to safety, while two other officers returned fire at the suspect. But the baby appearing unharmed in the middle of that gunfire, still on that doorstep. Finally, SWAT entering the home, the gunman already dead. If I seem upset, I am. This is senseless, it doesn't need to happen, and it continues to happen over and over again. And Phil, over the past 24 hours, 15 officers have been wounded by gunfire nationwide. And here in Phoenix, we have just learned that that suspect and the woman he allegedly shot, both of them have died, but that their daughter has survived. Police say she's gonna be okay. Phil. Thankfully, Matt. Appreciate that. Still ahead here on Prime, on the heels of the family statement autopsy results in the death of Bob Saget, now out, we'll tell you what we know. The remarkable young quarterback who could become a living legend instantly in Cincinnati, who is Joe Burrow? Court protections restored for some of the gray wolves here at home while over in Australia, concerns grow about the koala population. We're gonna take a look by the numbers, but first, our tweet of the day, this is from Barstool. Not sure if it's even real, but talk about a terrifying first date. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. It was a scary time in the 70s. You had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. 
there were so many murders happening, you had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. Breaking news overnight. Your money and concerns about inflation. The pandemic is not over. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say. And what to expect in the day ahead. From the top of the world, baby! ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Weekday morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Now to a court ruling that could help save the gray wolf population here in the U.S. California federal judge has restored protections for these animals after the Trump administration took them off the endangered species list and handed control over to the states. Here's a closer look by the numbers. Gray wolves used to live across two-thirds of U.S. land. They were mostly wiped out by the 1930s. However, before the Trump administration's rule change, they had been making an impressive comeback. Today, there are about 4,000 400 gray wolves in the western Great Lakes region that could see more protections after this court ruling. An additional 2,000 wolves live in the northern Rockies and Pacific Northwest, wolf populations that were not covered in this lawsuit, but a separate review of their status is now underway. Last February, trappers and trophy hunters killed at least 216 wolves over one four-day trip, and that sparked national outrage. Recently, another 23 wolves wandered out of Yellowstone National park and were killed. And while we're on the subject of at-risk wild animals, we also want to mention that today koalas were declared officially endangered in eastern Australia. There are less than 100,000 koalas left in the wild, and that is according to estimates by the Australian Koala Foundation. We still have a ton to get to here on Prime. Britain's Prince Charles has COVID and met with his mother just days ago. We'll have the latest on the Queen's health. The stunning fall from grace for a star of a hit reality show about the cheerleading world. We've got details on that as well. And how to make that Super Bowl get together more affordable. But first, but first a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Time, anytime. Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17 year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. 
How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True Crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. In an unexpected move, Pfizer pressing pause, the drug company now delaying its emergency use authorization request for its vaccine in children under five. The government had already been prepping to send out 10 million doses for that age group, and shots in arms were expected by the end of the month. But now Pfizer wants to continue studying data with the three-dose vaccine series with plans to seek authorization again at a later time. This as at least 11 states ease COVID restrictions with Omicron in retreat across the country, some governors moving to end indoor mask mandates, others lifting requirements in schools. The CDC insists most people should still be wearing masks indoors with transmission high in nearly all U.S. counties. As hopes for diplomacy fade, the crisis in Ukraine is deepening. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan suggesting Russia could invade Ukraine before the Winter Olympics end February 20th. Russia is conducting massive military drills in Ukraine's northern neighborhood of Belarus and in the Black Sea. The Kremlin continues to deny it has plans to invade and is accusing the U.S. of a conspiracy to whip up tensions. The White House is urging the up to 15,000 Americans living in Ukraine to leave within the next 24 to 48 hours. Several other countries, including the U.K., also telling their citizens to leave Ukraine now. New details in the death of comedian Bob Saget. The newly released autopsy report states Saget died from an unwitnessed accidental fall backwards, apparently causing numerous skull fractures and bleeding in his brain, killing the 65-year-old actor, who was found lifeless in his hotel room in Orlando last month. That autopsy also revealing that at the time of his death, Saget had underlying heart disease. The star was also COVID-19 positive. Screen performed by the coroner also found the prescription drug clonazepam in his system, used for panic attacks, anxiety, or seizures. Also, trazodone, which can be prescribed to treat depression or 
used as a sleep aid. The autopsy report doesn't suggest the medication or his heart disease contributed to his death. A nearly 58-year-old cold case solved in 1964 as 9-year-old Maurice Ann Shivarella was walking to school in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. She was abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered. Her body dumped at this strip mine. Her killer was never found until now. Through DNA and genetic genealogy links, police identified James Fort, who was 22 at the time, as her killer. And the case was cracked with the help of a 20-year-old college student whose expertise in genetic genealogy has also helped with cold cases in Chicago and Philadelphia. Fort died in 1980 of natural causes. And despite the fact that he can't be prosecuted, Maurice's family says knowing his identity helps. A stunning downward spiral for former cheer star Jerry Harris, pleading guilty in the child pornography case that rocked the reality TV world. The 22-year-old sensation quickly shot to stardom as a favorite on the hit Netflix show. But Harris now pleading guilty to receiving child pornography and engaging in travel for the purpose of engaging in illicit sexual act with a minor. Kristen, the mother of two of Harris's alleged victims, now 16-year-old twins, saying his charming image was a facade. Harris's attorney telling ABC News he wishes to take responsibility for his actions and publicly convey his remorse for the harm he has caused the victims in this case. Now, even more California love in 2022 from Dr. Dre, the legendary hip-hop hitmaker predicting another smash live from L.A.'s SoFi Stadium this Super Bowl Sunday. Rehearsals said to be so secretive, tunes from Bon Jovi and the Red Hot Chili Peppers used to drown out the songs on the coveted set list. We're going to open more doors for hip-hop artists in the future and making sure that the NFL understands that this is what it should have been a long time ago. We're going to turn now to the warnings from U.S. officials that Iran could be weeks away from having enough fuel to build a nuclear weapon. ABC's Martha Raddatz is on the ground in Iran as the high-stakes talks to revive the Iran nuclear deal struggle to achieve a breakthrough. On the streets of Tehran, a show of national pride, marking the 43rd anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. The message familiar, death to America. But this year, behind the words, an ominous new development. Iran showing the world its newest long-range missile, claiming it can evade detection and easily strike Israel and U.S. bases in the region. Administration officials now warning Iran could have enough fuel for a nuclear bomb within weeks, though it would take at least another year to build the bomb itself. But for Iranians themselves, this isn't so much about nuclear power or nuclear weapons. It's about the economy and those sanctions that are crushing them. Iranians we spoke with described being caught in an economic vice. What are you going without? What's ex more ex what's more expensive now? What are you seeing in the markets? Food items are expensive, she tells us. Housing is also expensive. When you don't have enough to spend on those two, you can't go and spend on leisure and travel and all of that. Former President Donald Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear agreement, thinking tougher sanctions would help him cut a better deal. They didn't. Now negotiations have resumed, but more than ever, the clock is ticking. Martha Raditz joins me now from Tehran. Martha, what's the latest on the chances that these particular negotiations could actually produce a revived nuclear deal? Well, they have made small progress, Phil, but they really do have a long way to go. Major issues still remain, so it's still about a 50-50 chance this will work out. Phil? Martha Raditz from Tehran tonight. Thank you. Queen Elizabeth is still being monitored after coming into contact with her son, Prince Charles, who has tested positive for COVID-19. Charles's wife, Camilla, tested negative and has continued with her scheduled appearances. And for now, at least, the 95-year-old monarch has not yet shown any sign of infection. Now to this weekend's big game. If Cincinnati Bengals quarterback Joe Burrow wins it all in just his second season, it will be the latest unlikely feat in his improbable yet promising young career. ABC's Kenna Whitworth caught up with those who know Burrow best about his remarkable journey.
There's always going to be doubters, and I, I've certainly had a lot of them up until this point and continue to have them. I work really hard to be a really good player, and I'm going to continue to do that whether I have doubters or, or not. For Joe Burrow, winning expectations started early. His father, Jimmy, remembers a basketball game when his son was just 10 years old, and they were losing. He came by, and he just he looked at me, and I, I can remember this like it was yesterday, and I just said, don't give up. And he literally scored the next nine points, and we won the game. And it's just something that that, that was special. I mean, his his coaches to this day still still talk about that because it was an almost impossible situation. By the time he was 15, Joe was the starting quarterback and leader of his high school football team. It was um, very quickly. I realized he was different physically, mentally, emotionally. After high school, Burrow chose to stay close to home and played Ohio State. But approaching his junior year, it was clear he wouldn't be the starting quarterback for the Buckeyes. You know, all of a sudden, uh, uh, he's, he's got this hard decision, probably the, the, the one, the first hard personal decision that he ever had to, had to make in his life. And it was tough. He wanted to win a national championship, and he thought LSU would give him that opportunity. He bet on himself, risked everything he knew, and transferred to Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He's always liked challenges. The, the only one, really, that he didn't, in his mind, overcome was the, the challenge of being the starting quarterback at Ohio State. I'm sure that he still uses that as a chip on his shoulder, and he's always playing uh, uh, with a chip on his shoulder. In Louisiana, he won the starting job, then the national title, and 15 awards, including the Heisman, a platform he used to highlight the suffering and food insecurity in his hometown of Athens, Ohio. I'm up here for all those kids in Athens County that, you know, go home to not a lot of food on the table. It was 31 seconds that has since transformed the Athens food pantry. There would be times where we would run out and we would have to turn people away because we did not have, have food. Within a month of Burroughs' speech, over $650,000 had been donated. We do not run out of food. Huge change to know that when people came, we would never have to turn them away. And the money kept coming. Now, the Joe Burrow Hunger Relief Fund has raised $1.5 million. We are extremely grateful. And we would not be able to do that if it had not been for that speech and for the generosity of so many people all over the country and the generosity that they're still showing to this day. And just four months later, Burrow was the number one overall pick. The kid from Ohio finding his way home. The Cincinnati Bengals select Joe Burrow, quarterback, LSU. You know, Joe doesn't doesn't expect anything to be given to him just because he's the quarterback and, and uh, he's the leader of that team. People see that he's he's always working hard. He's not a, a, a vocal type leader. So, you know, there's there's something there, too, that that's just hard to hard to put your finger on the intangibles. <laughs> that's correct. But 10 games into his first season, Burrow suffered a major knee injury, needing reconstructive surgery to repair a torn ACL, MCL, and PCL. Some people said he, he wouldn't be back maybe the whole season. He probably wouldn't be uh, back to the caliber of player that he was. And once again, you know, the, the chip on the shoulder and trying to prove people wrong. Burrow recovered so quickly, he earned the NFL's Comeback Player of the Year honor. And now in just his second year in the NFL, he will make his Super Bowl debut faster than any other quarterback drafted number one overall. Playing against the Rams and Matthew Stafford, also a number one overall pick, who is making his Super Bowl debut after 13 years in the league. While comparisons are being debated, Joe Burrow has his own style and a relentless drive to win. Joe and that team represents, you know, hardworking uh, people from Ohio, and Joe being from Ohio makes it makes it even more special. I think the fact that football gives him the opportunities for these big pressure moments on a big stage is really why he plays. I, I think that's what drives him. And those who have supported him along the way will be in the stadium to see it. I mean, without Coach Wyatt, I wouldn't be here today. He really kind of introduced me into the quarterback position at a high level in high school. So when he reached out to you and said, Coach, I want you to be in the stands when I play in the Super Bowl, <laughs> what did that mean to you? Personally, I love Joe. I, I love all the guys that I coach. Um, I, I can't even fathom what it's going to feel like to be in that stadium and look on the field and see an Athens Bulldog, you know, at quarterback in the Super Bowl. It's... 
Um, I, I've tried to put it into words, but I don't really know how I'm going to feel. An amazing feeling it will be. Kana Whitworth joins us now from the site of this weekend Super Bowl in L.A. Kana, those Bengal fans have certainly gotten on board the Borough bandwagon. Why do you think this home state hero is resonating so much in Cincy? I mean, outside of all the winning. Well, you know, part of it, I think, is what his dad said, you know, that Joe Burrow really represents the hardworking people in Ohio. And when I spoke with people at the Athens Food Pantry, they consider him a hero. And that's something that is garnering a lot of support, along with the fact that Joe Burrow really embraces that underdog mentality. And so people like that. And you're seeing all kinds of people come uh, coming here to take pictures, and many of them have on Joe Burrow jerseys or Bengals jerseys. The support is palpable. And also, you know, in Dayton, Ohio, the hospital there lit up their tower orange at Dayton Children's, and they put up the Bengals mantra of why not us? And, you know, the Bengals will have a chance to answer that question on Sunday. And imagine if he wins. Kana, thanks so much. Yeah. And as you get ready to watch the big game this weekend, whether you're just hanging out with family or maybe you're planning a big gathering, there are ways to save on everything that you need from a, maybe a TV upgrade, small appliances, to food. Trey Bodge is the smart shopping expert for TrueTrade.com. She is here to share tips on uh, how we can save, even how to keep the non-sports fans in your house, including your kids, entertained. Trey, welcome. Thanks so much for having me back. Good to have you back. Let's break it down by the numbers. How many people plan to watch the game this year and how much will they spend? Sure. So according to the National Retail Federation, about 184 million people are going to be watching the game. That's a little bit lower than last year. Um, but what's really exciting is that 90 million people are planning to watch or are planning to attend a party or throw a party. And that's a big jump over 63 million last year. And so it's a sign that we're returning to normal a little bit. And spending is up slightly at 14.6 million, up from 13 .6 point nine million this year and because things are more expensive and we're just going to get ready to talk about that you say the tvs are typically on sale around this time of year especially the big ones given lingering supply chain issues though is that happening again this year I am seeing sales, but I'm not seeing as many sales as I typically see, which is not surprising, of course, given the supply chain issues. I'm seeing sales everywhere from Best Buy, Walmart, PC Richards. In fact, SlickDeals.net, which is a site that I work with, has two really strong smart TV sales. So as an example of what you can save, you can save $350 off a Hisense home theater TV, $130 off a 55-inch Samsung TV. So the savings are there. I would also look at savings for or small home appliances. If you're looking to do some cooking uh, during the big game, you can save on things like air fryers and rice cookers and things like that. Of course, grocery prices, prices are sky high right now. We've been doing story after story on that. Are there still ways, though, to save on food? Yes, and so this is such an important point because grocery prices are so, so high. Uh, what I would recommend are a couple things. So if, if you have a wholesale club membership, this is the time to use it because buying in bulk, you can save up to 40% just by doing that. And so what I would suggest is going to your local Sam's Club or Costco and planning your menu according to what you see at the wholesale club. Another way to save is to use an app like allrecipes.com. I like it because you can pull up a recipe and it'll show you what's on sale nearby. And then the last thing is have a potluck. There is no need for you to shoulder the responsibility and the expense of everything being served. And friends love to show off their favorite recipes as well. All right, Trey, here's an important question because we know not everybody in the household is a football fan, might not want to watch the game. I know when my kids were, were real little, we had another TV in a separate room with something that they liked <laughs> on it. But what do you suggest to keep those non-sports fans entertained? Well, that's a great plan, Phil. I like that idea of having the kids in another room watching a movie or something. I just actually learned that Soul Publishing is going to be streaming five hours of crafts, and this is for kids and adults. You can find this content at Five Minute Crafts on YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok, and that will keep the non-sports fans busy during the big game. What ever happened to a good old game of Monopoly? <laughs> is that like, is that like do done Monopoly with board too. games? <laughs> Right. right. I love a board game, so I'm totally. with you on that. All right, Trey Bodge, thanks so much. We really do appreciate it every time you come on. Thanks for having me. All right, let's continue our Super Bowl coverage. Coming up on Prime, we talked about Joe Burrow. What about Matthew Stafford, his opposing quarterback, and The Rock, who's kept him grounded?
Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery, run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it. Serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Winner of nine Edward R. Murrow Awards, more than any other network, including winning for the third straight year the Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News is America's number one news source. With so much at stake, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one newscast and the number one program on television. Welcome back, everyone. Earlier, we told you about Joe Burrow's fight to reach the biggest game in football. Now, we want to turn to his rival counterpart, Matthew Stafford, quarterback, of course, the L.A. Rams. And for an intimate look at his life, ABC's Amy Robach spoke to his wife, Kelly, about their journey as college sweethearts, his career, her health, and the road to Super Bowl 56. When Los Angeles Rams quarterback Matthew Stafford takes the field on Sunday, it will be his chance to finally live up to the expectations that have followed him for his entire career. Stafford, end zone cut, got it, touchdown Rams! Stafford's wife Kelly has been his biggest cheerleader. Can you tell me what it was like that moment when you realized that the Rams I'm had finished it? I am so excited for him. I mean, he has worked his butt off for a long time. And if they didn't make it to the Super Bowl, they were a bust, you know. So now that that pressure is kind of taken off in a way, he can just go play this game and have some fun while he's doing it. After winning the NFC Championship, Stafford taking the opportunity to credit Kelly for fueling his performance. I couldn't have done it without her. She's been through uh, a lot of that with me. And uh, we've leaned on each other at separate times, you know, to, to help ourselves, you know, get through whatever we're having to, you know, get through. One of those moments they leaned on each other, a terrifying health scare in 2019. I wouldn't be here today without him. He was the one that really encouraged me to go get checked and fought with me through that entire battle. Kelly undergoing a 12-hour surgery to remove a brain tumor, relearning to walk, and being forced to take time away from their young daughters while she recovered. They said, you know what, you can't have any kids around you, you can't have anything around you because it'll throw off your balance, you'll fall, you'll injure yourself. So we actually had to uh, say goodbye to our kids for, I think, about three weeks. And Matthew really became the most amazing caregiver. And it didn't surprise me. I guess it just more impressed me 
Kelly letting fans behind the scenes on her podcast called The Morning After. All right, y'all, Morning After with me. Where she talks about everything from parenting struggles to mental health and, of course, football. I feel like sometimes, especially being the wife or a significant other of a professional athlete or anyone who has this kind of limelight, you tend to lose yourself. And I just felt as a mom in particular, it's mainly for moms to just come and be like, hey, no one has their stuff together. Like, if we can get through these days and our children are happy and healthy, that's all you can hope for. Do you have a plan for a podcast on the Monday after the Super Bowl? I do. <laughs> a little preview? Yeah, we do film on Mondays. Honestly, depending on the outcome, um, it might be a podcast on no sleep. Um, it might be a podcast where I have, uh, you know, a little alcohol in my system if we do uh, take that victory. So um, hoping for that, it'll be entertaining, I'm sure. And no one could blame her. Amy, thank you. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, it's a mermaid show that took place in Shanghai, China. Take a look at this picture. The swimmers side by side with rare fish in what is being described as the world's first seven degree tilt immersive exhibition tank. Very cool. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us. After 60 something years, the time has come again. Now, a West Side Story for a new generation. Oye, honey! Ponle fuego! Vamos! Oh my gosh, we are making West Side Story. Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. I don't think of it as a remake, it's a reimagining. The story is still very much alive. What is amazing is to be able to revive the production with a Latinx community. Behind the scenes. The choreography, the dance rehearsals, the music. And it's like only Spielberg could can <laughs> shut down New York. The new stars from Shrek to starring for Spielberg. Finding out for the first time, I didn't cry, I cursed. Yikes, sorry, Mom. <laughs> this is a childhood dream role. This is why I like to tell actors who get the parts personally. I want to hear them cry. The original stars. There is a part in here that Tony Kushner wrote for you. Race and representation. It's so important for people like us to see people like us on screen. I mean, it makes me super emotional, so I apologize. And Stephen Sondheim's final interview for American TV. Just the idea of Spielberg excited me. I'm just so proud and honored that I got this shot late in my career. Amazing! <laughs> There's so much of West Side Story, which is a celebration of just how do you sing the language of love? How do you communicate your deepest feelings to another person? West Side Story, it's everything. Drama, it's romance, it's passion, it's humor. I think it was a very bold attempt at something that had never been done. They'll start with Broadway. It was Shakespeare's Capulets and Montagues turned into the ghetto. The musical West Side Story is set on the west side of Manhattan during the 1950s. It's about two warring teenage gangs, the Sharks, who are Puerto Rican, and the Jets, who are ethnic whites. It's sort of Romeo and Juliet, a Puerto Rican girl and a Polish guy. And you have these star-crossed lovers that probably shouldn't fall in love, but they do. And while they don't have Shakespeare's balcony to declare their love to each other on, they do have a New York City fire escape. Every sight that I see is Maria. Tony, Tony. It still speaks to us because Romeo and Juliet and subsequently West Side Story are both about love trying to rise above hatred. Walking tall. We always walk tall, but yet! 
And so now West Side Story is being reimagined by Steven Spielberg. The Oscar goes to Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg. Three-time Oscar winner, highest grossing director in the history of Hollywood. He's fluent in the language of film. Just look at his movies. They're some of the biggest blockbusters in history. You've got Schindler's List, E.T., the Indiana Jones movies, and, of course, Jaws. Why now? The score has been in my life since I was 10 years old. My parents bought the original Broadway cast album for West Side Story. Tonight, tonight. And memorized every song. And it was my favorite musical my entire life. If we had been in your home back then, would we have seen a young Steven Spielberg singing this music around the house? Uh, uh, no. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 no. I, you know, what, what's that Clint Eastwood said in that movie? Man's got to know his limitations. <laughs> okay. I, I knew my limitation. It wasn't as a singer. But I love the music so much. Tonight is the New York opening of West Side Story. We've been working on this steadily for nine months. This was way ahead of its time in the 50s. So you're hearing about race, turf wars in New York. The choreography and the music was groundbreaking. There will be time to read the reviews, have a drink of celebration or perhaps consolation. And it got a fantastic opening night party. Among the attendees is Cheetah Rivera, who originated the role on stage of Anita. I happen to think that West Side Story was perfect. I was lucky enough to be a part of it. Every single night I went in there, I was totally complete. It was directed, conceived, and choreographed by Jerome Robbins, booked by Arthur Lawrence, music by Leonard Bernstein, lyrics by Stephen Sondheim, that legend of musical theater getting his big break at just 25 years of age. Arthur had heard my work, so when they were looking for lyricists, I happened to run into him at a party. He was telling me, I'm working on this musical of Romeo and Juliet. I was not looking for a job. I said, who's doing the lyrics? And he said, oh, I never thought of you. <laughs> it was more than that. He said, I didn't much like your music, but I thought your lyrics were really good. So. I got the job. History making is the word for the motion picture critics have acclaimed as a masterpiece. So four years later, 1961, there's a big screen version of West Side Story that's a massive hit. You know, you think about the scene of Rita Moreno on the rooftop of New York City in that gorgeous purple dress. My first recollection of West Side Story was my abuelita y mi mamá talking about Rita Moreno. And I remember wanting so badly to be Anita for Halloween, but my mom was like, just because you wear a purple dress does not mean people are going to know who you are for Halloween. We're a Puerto Rican family. For us, it was really the first time we saw that type of representation here on the mainland. It goes on to win 10 Academy Awards and continues to be a beloved classic, which maybe is why Steven Spielberg reimagining it on the big screen is a big risk. You've never directed a musical before. No, I never have. There's been a couple of musical numbers in a few of my feature films. So maybe you remember the opening sequence of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. There's a big Anything Goes number. If you actually go to the Blu-ray version, you can actually find Kate Capshaw, the star of the film, interviewing her future husband about that number. So Mr. Spielberg, how does it feel directing a musical? Well, it feels just, just well. And just how well. How do you go about remaking a masterpiece? We never attempted to remake the 61 film. We took all of our inspiration based on the original source material which was a 1957 Broadway musical. It's an insane score. It is incredibly convoluted, and Bernstein is and was a genius. In the case of Bernstein, Robbins, Lawrence, and Sondheim, they all had these elements of otherness in the United States. There were four Jewish gay men that understood the whole notion of the immigrant's journey getting into a country that accepts them for their talent, maybe doesn't accept them for who they really are. And so they knew how to write about other outsiders. 
Who asked you to move here? Who asked you? Who are you Not where you came from. Spix, Mick, what? The great thing about art is that it's personal. Something about the characters and the story in some way familiar it resonates. And something about West Side Story does that. Tonight, tonight. Many people are caught between red and blue or black and white. I actually think it's more relevant today than it was in 57 when they put it up on the boards for the first time. So joining Spielberg on this journey, a legend in his own right, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Angels in America, Tony Kushner, who also collaborated with Spielberg on the screenplays for Munich and on Lincoln. I came back from having breakfast with Spielberg and he had said, I want to do West Side Story, I want you to write the screenplay. I said, Steven's lost his mind, he wants to remake West Side Story. Let's go, boys. What did you think you could bring to this material? Uh, my love. My love for Stephen Sondheim, for Leonard Bernstein, for Arthur Lawrence, for Jerome Robbins, and everything that they inspired me as a kid. And I also thought, after 60-something years, the time has come again, because this should be shared generationally. And after 60-something years, love for West Side Story was still deeply felt by Stephen Sondheim in this, his last American television interview before his passing on November 26, at the age of 91. I was 25 years old, and, and it was a thrill, and then have it come out so well. I'm proud of the show. I learned so much from those three guys. So it was a crash course in how to write for the musical theater. For Steven Spielberg, for Tony Kushner, it's a huge thing to really want to, to redo. And so is it a gamble? Probably. It's a huge, huge risk remaking something that is so iconic, as West Side Story is. When we come back, betting it all on a Maria from a high school musical. And a Tony who's going from baby driver to leading man. But I just tried to jump into it and sing it. Next. Must be able to sing, dance experience is a plus. That's from the casting call that goes out in 2018 to try to get performers to appear in this reimagined version of West Side Story. It was a global search. I posted one flyer on social media one day and then it went viral. We had 35,000 people sent in their audition tapes for four parts, for Maria, for Anita, for Tony, and for Nardo, 35,000 tapes. Self-tapes from everywhere, Australia, Latin America, Argentina, Spain. And one of the first tapes that comes in is from a teenage girl from New Jersey who wants to be Maria. I responded to an open casting call that our casting director, Cindy Tolan, posted on Twitter. And my friend McKenna from California sent it to me with the caption, thank me when you're famous. I was looking for somebody who could act, sing, and dance. And most of our cast have never, 50 cast members have never been in a movie before, including Rachel, who, who is right out of uh, playing Princess Fiona in her high school senior year production of Shrek. She was the second person I saw out of 30 people the first day. Among the actors who wanted to play Tony was a young man who'd been in Baby Driver. I'm a driver. And in The Fault in Our Stars. I hope you realize you're trying to keep your distance from me in no way lessens my affection for you. And that was Ansel Elgort. I did a lot of musicals in high school, just like Rachel did. And then somehow I ended up doing movies and I still never made it to Broadway. But then this is kind of the perfect, like, the childhood dream role. And Ansel has a pretty ironic link to West Side Story. He went to high school in the actual neighborhood where the film is set, and he has a really interesting link to Leonard Bernstein. My father, who's a photographer, took photos of Leonard Bernstein, 
Um, and they were on the wall in my living room my whole life. And one day I said to my parents something about, oh yeah, the photos of grandpa on the wall above the piano. They said, there's no photos of grandpa on the wall above the piano. That's Leonard Bernstein. That's the guy who wrote West Side Story. So I grew up my whole life thinking Leonard Bernstein was my grandfather. And there, of course, is the part of Bernardo, who is the leader of the Sharks. I think, yeah, honestly, the hardest part to ultimately cast was Bernardo. He'd been looking for six months, and we weren't having any luck, really. And that's when Cindy Tolan remembered the three 10-year-olds who had starred in the stage production of the movie Billy Elliot on Broadway. If you go online, you can see the three of them accepting their Tony Award. Mom, Dad, two sisters. and Because they all won a Tony Award at 10 for it. And I'm like, turned to my office and I said, where's David Alvarez? Why aren't we auditioning David Alvarez? David dropped out of the business. He just stopped acting. He went into the army when he was a teenager. And then he was living in Ohio. And he looked like a lumberjack. I had been backpacking in Mexico for a couple years, so I was kind of off grid. And Cindy Tolan sent me a private message saying that they were casting for Bernardo for the new Steven Spielberg West Side Story movie. And now it's time to let the winners know that they got the gig. Did everyone cry when you called them on the phone to tell them that they had been cast in this? Yeah, yeah, they, they did. They cried. Listen, this is why I like to tell actors who get the parts personally. I want to get them when they least expect good news. I want to start with a kind of somber voice, like I'm setting them up for the fall, and then I want to tell them they got the part. And just let the tears fly. <laughs> Look, I'm weird, okay, but I like that. <laughs> Ariana DeBose had played a character called The Bullet in Hamilton. Now, she was about to get the call. I found out in a nail salon, I had tinfoils on my nails, and the phone rang. I would like to ask you if you would be my Anita in West Side Story, and I literally started silent crying. The poor little woman was like, aren't you OK? And I was like, I'm really good. Yes, sir, I would be so honored. I'm like, hey, Mr. Spielberg, nice to hear from you. I hope you're doing well. And it's like, oh, please, don't call me Mr. Spielberg. Call me Steven, because I'll be calling you Bernardo from now on. I got this call, unknown number, and picked it up, and it was Steven Spielberg. And Steven was obviously very giddy and giggly, and I think he loves he loves being able to tell people some, you know, deliver great news. I remember calling my parents afterwards, and we were all just, like, totally in tears. I didn't cry, I cursed. Yikes, sorry, Mom. <laughs> Even before the cameras were rolling, Steven Spielberg did something that is so impactful for the community. He already has 20 actors that are Puerto Rican or of Puerto Rican descent. It's groundbreaking. As much as I adore the original movie of West Side Story, there were a lot of things about the original West Side Story that could stand with improvement. And primarily, there's the fact that the actors who played the Sharks were not necessarily Latinx or Puerto Rican at all. You keep away from him. I'm going to think for myself. Tonight, tonight. It was very formative for me to be able to walk onto set and talk to people who live in Puerto Rico, who are Afro-Latino. Look who I found. Boom! Yay! <laughs> it makes me super emotional, so I apologize. It's so important for that next generation to see someone that looks like them, and it's something that I'm so unbelievably proud of. And as it turns out, somebody else was about to get the big call from Steven Spielberg, somebody who had won an Oscar for performing in West Side Story nearly 60 years earlier. My agent said, Steven Spielberg wants to call you. Can I give him your number? It's like, uh, are there hookers in Houston? Are you serious? Of course I want him to call me. Why would he be calling? I really honestly couldn't imagine. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. 
how do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is what being live is Freedom all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. Run, urgent delivery run. Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. When you think of the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, I'm sorry, it's the Jen Shaw Show. Ain't no party like a Jen Shaw party, because a Jen Shaw party now stop. Hey! Diva. Drama. Money and fame. Unpredictable. Unhinged. Crazier than anyone could have guessed. She was giving us the money, she was giving us the looks. It mm -hmm. seemed like she was the prime housewife, but... Then, suddenly... OMG. We've seen a lot of things on the Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Money, money. Real Housewives of Salt Lake City reality show star facing serious allegations. Let's unpack this. The whole time she was filming the show, law enforcement was investigating her. I don't know if she knew that she was going to be arrested that day. But those braids, honey, those braids look good. Money, money, money. She's accused of an elaborate fraud scheme. A huge telemarketing fraud. Speaking with the victims was heart-wrenching. If I can talk to the people that scam me, I would say, would you do this to your mother? Jen Shaw pled not guilty to the charges that she's facing. Her defenses are that she's not the one that is selling these other services. She's just providing leads. She shouldn't be criminally liable. Jen going to trial is going to be really, really... Shaw amazing. Wild. Money, 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 make the world go Y'all can keep getting pissed off. I don't care. <laughs> she just say that she's the Wizard of Oz, the woman behind the curtain. I think she's the Wicked Witch of the West. Money, 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 make my world go round. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money, money, money. My first recollection of West Side Story was the film. I was sitting in my grandmother's living room watching Dance at the Gym. And I saw the woman in the purple dress. And I was like, I knew I wanted to do that. Of course, later on, I discovered that the woman in the purple dress was Rita Moreno. I auditioned my arse off. I wanted that part so badly. 
and it was so thrilling to get it. Everyone wanted to be Rita Moreno. Who didn't want to be a Puerto Rican girl singing and dancing? It was so beautiful. And the fact that she showed Puerto Rican talent and that she tackled it and then some was for us a source of inspiration. Sometimes I don't know which is thicker, your skull or your accent. Rita Moreno, she's been in the movie business for 70 years. She has won an Emmy, an Oscar, a Tony, and a Grammy. That's right, she has the EGOT. But the girl who joined West Side Story was very beaten up. I was really barely hanging on. Before her Oscar-winning performance, Rita Moreno found herself amid the colorism and prejudice that really was a hallmark of Hollywood in that period, and it scarred her inside as well. For the longest time, I acquiesced. I hated it. I was offered nothing but island girls, or American Indian, or Egyptian girls. She was cast in The King and I as a character who is Burmese. My name is Toptim. I already speak English. As long as I was doing those kind of roles all the time, I was always going to have emotional problems because I had really no sense of myself. And I didn't feel strong enough that I could speak up about the situation to say, I don't want to do this. And when I finally got to play a genuine Latina. What am I? Cut glass? Anita. I thought, this is my role model. A little late in the day, I was almost 30. I never was afraid to depict her. So tell Chino that Tony's hiding in the cell. Don't you touch me. Because it was me. So at the Oscars, Rock Hudson reads the nominees and reveals the winner. Rita Moreno and West Side Star. Rita Moreno was idolized by all of us in the Puerto Rican community in New York. I can't believe it! Good Lord! I leave you with that. I understand that people were shouting from the rooftops that Rita Moreno had won the Oscar. Fast forward about six decades, and fate comes knocking again. My agent said, Steven Spielberg wants to call you. Can I give him your number? Are you serious? Of course I want him to call me. And he said, I'm, I'm wondering if you would be interested in being a part of it. And I said to him, um, you know, I'm so flattered, but I don't do cameos. He said, cameo? No, there is a part in here that Tony Kushner wrote for you. I just want to know if you're interested. I said, I, yes, I am. <laughs> That. Tony Kushner came up with the idea, what if you got Rita Moreno to play Doc's widow? Come on, Doc. I'm gonna get you. I'm sick. So Doc has died, and the widow has taken over the candy store. When Tony called me about this idea, I thought it was a masterstroke. I really did. We wanted her knowledge and her wisdom and, you know, her incredible talent. And when she walked on the rehearsal stage for the first time, and they saw the Rita Moreno coming in to tell her story to our 60-member ensemble company. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. What's forever? Like, I want to be with you forever. You don't want to start maybe with, I'd like to take you out to coffee? She comes in with so much energy to the rehearsal process. It's unbelievable. I took every opportunity I could to sit and chat with her about nothing and about very important things, about this industry, about how unkind it can be to Latinas. Rita Moreno would bring up to those young cast members those stories about, for example, the makeup department darkening the skin of some of the actors. There was not an understanding that Puerto Ricans have all the colors of the rainbow and a very complex cultural and, and, and racial history. I used to hate that very dark makeup that they used on all the sharks. I mean, we were really all mostly one shade. And I said, God, I hate this makeup. Why does it have to be so dark? I said, I'm Puerto Rican. I said, why can't we be my color? It truly never occurred to me that times would change. Didn't you hear me? What are you doing? 
Rita's performance as Anita would of course cast a shadow over Ariana DeBose, who now had to take on this iconic role. And those are some pretty big shoes to step into. In fact, I almost didn't audition for the film. It's like I identify as Afro-Latino. And growing up, I didn't necessarily have access to my Hispanic heritage. Speak English. I thought that I wasn't Hispanic enough, or that I wasn't Latina enough. But I will tell you this, I'm not black enough in certain circles, and I'm not Latina enough in others. And it, it, West Side Story, oddly enough, was one of the first experiences I've ever had where I felt Amazing. embraced by a community and what I had to offer was enough. And I said to Steven Spielberg, if you're really going to consider me for this 